Hi everyone, this the lecture is going to be about the motivation of the definition of the differentiability of the two variable functions. So after, if I think gave you enough um, evidence and good motivation for the shape of the definition of this differentiable differentiability of two variable function, one might use that to approach three variable and four variable function and then find that definition of a differentiability of a reasonable. So the first part is reviewing the differentiability of one variable functions. So it is about the existence of this limit here, which is motivated by computing the instantaneous rate of change of the value of f, function value f. And uh, in xy plane is usually represented by it like this, where this h represents increment of x, um, x values, where h can be negative, and increment y value is taken in this order. So slope of this line is representing here the limit behavior, and if that uh, limit exists, in uh, then we, we say it's differentiable. In typical pictures of a function that is not differentiable would be, we, one should, we should miss this case though, where the function is discontinuous, then it's also not differentiable, and it's continuous although, but the behavior of a tangent line, rate of change to the right, and the behavior of the tangent rate of change to the left is obviously different. A very uh, more subtle example is, could be the following. If you approach it here, the tangent line more like this dotted line there, and the other one is a slightly different approach. Um, that's, uh, that's one example of a functions in two var uh, one variable in whose graph is in this xy plane such that it's not turned out is not differentiable. The whole uh, goal is this um, turning this more geometric uh, picture into a more analytic definition. So you're going to go back and forth of this more analytic definition and how it uh, corresponds to the geometry from there we um, kind of justify our definition of a uh, differentiability uh, for two variables. So here's analytic definition of differentiability and slightly different approach. This LX is usually called a linear approximation. Whether it's a good approximation or not, we just call this as linear approximation. So it starts like this, FA, the function value, and this X minus A times the slope part here, which is this F prime of A. So if it's differentiable at A, and we do have this number defined, F prime of A. The reason this is called a linear uh, approximation is because if you look at the just around the value of a, if you zoom in so closely into that part, maybe it is very difficult to distinguish this line, the red line here, which is the graph of this function lx. It's difficult to distinguish the line from this curve actually there. In that sense, it's a good approximation. Um, but um, there's a, another way of looking at this uh, good part of this approximation, which is following which is the following, that its approximation is definitely about how different is it from the actual function value f of x here and approximation we're using is lx. So how is this difference compared to how close we are to x minus a? So they think about dividing the relative size of this error we are introducing here relative to this um, your input x minus a and how um, if you're really close to A, of course this number will be very small, this number here. So the correct way to measure is that maybe we have to look at this error in the relative to x minus A. So idea is taking a quotient. If this quotient is even going to zero, the relative size of this difference of the function value we're approximating with this Lx, then relatively it's small enough, and then that's a good approximation. So that's, that's uh, this limit is kind of a meaning of a approximation being good. So if you are dividing with this x minus a, we call it a linear approximation. If you're comparing this difference of function values with square term, x minus a squared, we call it a quadratic approximation, and so on. So this is how we write it. The limit behavior simply means if I set this fx minus lx divided by x minus a here equal to if I call that function x, of course this one is not defined at x equals a, but um, its behavior, limit behavior is approaching a, so we can kind of piecewise define this function ex.
then if you solve for LX you can write it this way there is a linear approximation part plus X minus a times this function EX which is rest of the part goes in here with this property that EX approaches 0. Now let's actually take a look at the proof that this LX is a good approximation. So let me remind you of the, the meaning of this good part is this difference of actual function value f of x and LX, this approximation, is relatively small. So if you divide that difference by a, let me show you and go back like this, divide the difference by a and the difference is um, approaching 0. So here's how it starts, the uh, differentiability that we're trying to connect the differentiability with this good approximation property. Differ differentiability is the existence of this following limit, so the limit will be this number, it's denoted by f prime of a. How to go from here to there is that if you get rid of this limit, all we know is that this, this function here, the quantity in the left hand side is defined, and it's not going to be exactly equal because h is some number. And the difference here, is some cutout here, is E of H, I call this difference error term. So all we know is just whatever the difference here between this F prime of A and the left hand side of this one, this one without limit, there will be some term left out. But as H approaches zero like this, this one is going to be smaller and smaller. That's exactly, the this right hand side is a little bit a more specific version of this limit statement. So if you solve this, this part right here for f of a plus h, then it turns out like this. f h is going to be varying, so around this a, so a plus h, it will be the values very close to a. So this is what we wanted to measure, f of a plus h. And f of a is fixed, and this is a number associated with this entire setting. And h is something varying how much is, how many units you're away from that part a. So H and EH, these are all um, some parts that's uh, changing. So we kind of, um, you can't just distribute F of A plus H, but this is how in general if a differentiable function breaks down. So if you want to, you know, split this A and H, and there is this rule to um, split that. So uh, more um familiar notation, we have to write this a plus h as x and know that x is quantity that is close to a as h is a small quantity. Then it looks like this, f of x, since we wrote a plus h x here, f of x is going to be in this form where all the h is replaced by, x minus h is replaced by, um, misspoke, h is replaced by x minus a. And we call that part right there called linear approximation. So um, let's uh, bring out this meaning of a good approximation part, which is about the difference between fx and lx that showed up as we kind of break this um, limit expression. So lx, the linear approximation part showed up here. So if you group it with f of x and lx there, that will be the difference. Then we have multiplicative factor of x minus a, so if you divide both sides, you arrive here, and the right-hand side is only having this error term, which came from that part right there. So that guarantees our approach is zero because we have this limit condition. So that's, that's what we mean by good linear approximation right there. The difference with the function value and the approximation relative to um, your input value, size of the input value, away from part A is measured in this way, it's approaching as well, so therefore it's a good approximation. So um, let me make additional remark about um, this good approximation idea. This linear function is the actually the only linear function with this property, such that the difference of the values, uh, actual function value and a linear approximation is relatively small, um, smaller than um, our input size relative to a. So that um, shows us another good uh, property of the good choices um, this um, linear approximation provides. So let me summarize what we have just uh, what we have done so that it nicely leads to um, the two variable case. So um, 
In short, what we have just done is a differentiability, that limit exists. Actually, we looked at the existence of a tangent line. That's basically what the, uh, the very first definition is, differentiability. But we looked at this um, tangent line as a good approximation. So differentiability, and you can interpret it not geometrically, but more analytic uh, interpretation is a this differentiability really implies a good linear approximation. So that uh, limit thing we looked at fx minus lx divided by x minus a approaches zero, and that appro uh, property is a, uh, interpreted as a good approximation, and that's basically we're translating that differentiability into good linear approximation. That's what we have just done. So um, let's look at the two variable case. So let's first think about the shape of the graphs of two variable functions. Because the two variable, it, it, the shapes are surfaces rather than curves, like one variable case, this time it's the surfaces. So correct uh, analog for the tangent line, here will be tangent plane. So whatever that means, we're going to use that as a good linear approximation. So if you have the function f of x, this tangent plane, and we're going to put the meaning to the good part there, but once we do that, and this tangent plane will turn out a good linear approximation f of x, y, the values around whatever the points we fix, such as a comma b. Um, then uh, any functions that um, has this tangent plane as a good linear approximation should be called differentiable, differentiable function. So let me use this Mathematica animation to demonstrate a function that is actually not differentiable. That's how we started. We looked at the, the very definition of the differentiability of one variable function, and then we looked at the function that is not differentiable. So I'm trying to do the same thing here. So this will be an example of the graph of a function who's, uh, which is not differentiable. It's because uh, its linear approximation is not going to be good. But let me first explain what kind of um, how this graph is constructed. So that's what we're going to uh, do first. So first I want to look at the shape of, of this one in general. If I turn this around, this is generated by um, swapping these lines that you see as a blue line. So I rotated this blue line going up and down like this. As you can see at the edge of the surface, that kind of shows that where the endpoint of this line is, then it's in red here. So I originally swapped this one in the circle flat and then I added this wiggly part there so it looks like this. So from this construction you might agree that there are lots and lots of lines there. There are this line and there are that line and there are this line. So it's made out of this little line segment just swapped around going up and down. So because it passes the vertical line test this must be a graph of a function although um, it's probably possible to write the Cartesian equation and solve it for z, but I think it's enough to, you know, see this one as a graph of a function since it passes the vertical line, vertical line test. So what's going to happen is that um, tangent plane is going to be some sort of plane that passes through some of these points here and then turn out to be a good linear approximation. But uh, let's think about this center point right there and think about what plane will contain good, you know, what would be the good approximation. So if you look at this red line and the blue line, the good candidate for the tangent plane, it has to be plane if you are looking at these two good lines that approximates this function nicely, that plane must contain these two lines. So there, there are not many planes that does that. There's, there's only one plane that contains these two blue and red lines. So, so I'm going to sketch that here. Right. In this animation, that tangent plane that contains this red line right there and the blue line right there, it's uh, this green plane right there, as you can see. So this is supposed to be linear approximation to this graph of a, um, to this graph of a function. But if you look at this thick line right there, right there, it has kind of constant difference with this uh, linear approximation we just uh, had, it's a tangent plane and that one. So the difference between these two function values, the linear approximation, what the linear approximation gives, and this line is not relatively smaller than the, um, 
this point we're looking at, the distance to that point we started with. This is the center point, and um, you can think of a point down there, and distance to that point. So because it's a linearity of keeping, the ratio of the function value in here with the distance to that um, function, uh, the base point 0, comma 0 there, is going to be actually constant, not approaching 0. So this is not so good linear approximation. So this is an example that the graph of a function is not well approximated by this type of tangent plane, linear approximation. So we should call this one, this function, not differentiable. Okay, we're back to the slide, and let me summarize um, what we have just seen is that actually an example of bad approximation. Therefore, an example of a function should be called not, not differentiable. So what just happened there is that the function value f of x, y, and the linear approximation, which was that flat horizontal plane, this function value difference of the function value is not quite approaching 0, but it was kind of non-zero constant if we along, um, approach along the path, whatever that path is that given by that black line, and it was parameterized by t. So here is a free variable is t, and this delta t is how much we're varying from that center position 0, 0. So this will be the uh, what to calculate if we have all those information. It turns out from the picture, kind of, what's because all the lean, it's made out of the lines, and this one will be supposed to be a non-zero constant. But if we want to call, this is a good linear approximation, this approximation should approach zero relative to the size of the input. So rather than giving you a nice uh, natural motivation to the following form of the differentiability, that would be actually confusing because lots of things are you know playing in. Rather, I'll give you this definition here now, and then um, we will use a theorem to relate this one into some sort of geometric or analytic statement that relates to linear approximation property. So they realize that the following statement is useful for um, to capture this uh, good approximation into this differentiability, and the following form is a good form to generalize to um, three or high more variable case. So this is, the, although it's for two variable, it's very very general uh, for me, uh, formulation. So let's look at here. Definition starts with like this: f of x is called differentiable at point a comma b, just like the zero comma zero that you looked at before in that mathematical animation. There are two numbers a and b, and there are two functions. So given a comma b there will be these two constants depending on that point. If I choose different point, there will be different numbers and different two functions. So these functions and numbers have certain property. That's how the shape of the statement look like. So there will be two numbers and two functions such that the function value f of x is expanded in the following form. So if you look at this first line here, that's the function value, that f of a, b, the function, the height, the z value of that center point of the non-differentiable example I introduced with the Mathematica. And these rest of the part is the plane equation. So this picks up certain planes. So basically this says this value of f of x, y is this value of a certain value of a uh, tangent plane, linear approximation, plus some of the terms that it's supposed to vanish as we compare this one with the size of the values of uh, input. So they require, like this, um, when we divide this one by the size of the input, there will be some cancellation for uh, x part, x minus a, and y part, y minus v. After we divide that out, still the what's remaining here and there is still approaching zero. So that gives you good uh, linear approximation part. So that's their definition of differentiability for two variable function. If it's three variable, you have to throw in more of the linear factor and the similar terms added in there. So that's the um, standard uh, mathematical definition of a differentiable. Um, so it has all the flavors of a good linear approximation. But further, I'd like to use this theorem to convince you even more that this is really the good approximation. Um, because the um, size of input, and I said, 
uh, that and versus the shape that you see at the end of this um, differentiability definition, it's not slightly, it's not quite the same as one variable situation. So maybe the following theorem will be um, useful to connect that idea. So what you are seeing here is that this one is the graph of a function z equals f of xy. And to make a connection to the, what we've been uh, what we looked at for the one variable function differentiability so we want to bring out the one variable situation out of that so, so we can make that connection so one idea is that you look at that point right there and then um, cut this surface with this uh, section sectional plane which is perpendicular to the xy plane right there and so this direction of this um, kind of line by the bottom line there is arbitrary we're gonna look at that point and decide how we're going to cut, but there are 360 degree cut, although it's actually 180 degree because it's kind of same if you flip it around 180 degree here. So there are, the, there are those many choices of a plane cut we can make. Each time when you do that, there is this going to be intersection line. So if you look at this plane H, which is kind of slanted here, so let me bring out that pic. If you look at plane H there, this intersection curve made with this section, plane section, plane and the curve, this is a sectional intersection curve, and this is a bottom line. You know, to us right now it looks like horizontal. So there will be this tangent line, and we know this tangent line is a good approximation, because that's what we have proven in the earlier part of this slide. So we accept that this line here is a good approximation. But um, as we consider in more and more directions, these good approximations, how they put together, and that's the that's the key. So this is the picture. Think about one line and one section up there. Then um, it's going to create this tangent line with this um, graph of uh, z equals f of x y, graph of function f of x y. But if you look at the different direction like this one, and then it's going to make a different cut. And that's also this this red line here is supposed to be the tangent line to some sort of sectional curve right there. If I consider this dotted direction, and then there will be some sort of a sectional curve and there will be a tangent line. At this point, there's no reason that all this, as we consider all these different directions, there is no reason that all this tangent line up there must be contained in one single plane. There is no reason for that. So you go back to that example that I showed in Mathematica, that how this was, that was actually um, you know, the tangent, the, the sectional curve in that example is not really the curve. The sectional curve was the straight line. So those were the blue line and red line and the thick black line. Those were really the tangent line one way or another. So they did not form a tangent plane. So that's why it's called uh, not differentiable. And this, this is the, another interesting property to set out that, uh, that captures the differentiability. So namely, all the tangent line involved in here in this um, view in the section sectional curves, they form a single common plane. So I made this um, little animation, a mathematic animation. So this is some sort of elliptic paraboloid and upside down. And then I chose one point down there. And up there, you can see there's uh, this tangent plane. It's a sectional curve, which is in kind of, it keeps changing the color, but you can see that sectional plane that cuts through, and this is the intersection curve right there. And then I um, sketch this uh, tangent line to that point, to this sectional curve, so you can see everything is happening in that plane, okay? So let's not think about this purple plane is showing right now, it's all about, uh, what I'm explaining is this direction down there, and this sectional plane, and it's cut through this elliptic paraboloid in this parabola right there. And there's this tangent line. So that's the one, one um, intersection, one uh, sectional uh, plane. So let me use this one to rotate around. So if you rotate around, for example, like this, it's going to be slightly different section we're looking at, and there will be a different sectional curve, and there's this. Uh, tangent line there. So each time when we look at it, we agree that these um, the red tangent line is a good approximation to this each of these 
uh, parabola there. So that's for sure. But um, if we have the luxury of having all that um, tangent line in one single plane, and that will be the awesome linear approximation for this two variable case. So as you can see, if I flip it around, these all the tangent planes happen to be within that tangent. I mean, tangent lines are within that tangent plane right there. Therefore, if they form a single plane like this, those tangent lines, all those different directions of a tangent line form a single tangent plane like we're seeing here, that must be the good uh, approximation. That must be equivalent to differentiability of the function we defined earlier. So that's the goal. So the back in here, and I wanted to show that if we define a differentiability like this, and uh, the theorem is that if it is differentiable, then all those tangent lines we just looked at form a single plane, um, and it is that linear approximation. And uh, if we, the conversely is also true, if the, all the tangent line form a single plane, like we've looked at here, and that must be the, the tangent plane, and with, from that we can conclude that that function actually satisfies the definition of differentiability it's set out here. Okay? So proof of that part is usually the homework for my students. So I'm not going to prove it here, but I will prove the other direction, which is uh, slightly harder and tricky. So here's a statement first. Let's prove that if all the tangent line we looked at form a single plane there, then f of x is in that form, differentiability. f of x has this nice expansion. I think I mentioned that in the animation, that if we have a two tangent line, we have lots of lots of tangent lines. If you only have two tangent lines, that will determine a plane. Okay, so we have a plane. That plane is namely this, for example, that if I choose a direction that is parallel to x-axis like this, and there will be this tangent line, this slope of this tangent line over this horizontal line back there is known as a partial the value of a partial derivative with respect to x at that point a comma a comma b comma zero or a comma b. And this line here is a parallel to y-axis, and then there's this tangent line, which is the tangent line to the sectional curve. And the slope of this line over this axis, the parallel axis over the um, bottom horizontal line, is known as partial derivative with respect to y. So if we have these two things, we already have a plane, and um, all the other sectional tangent lines and sectional curves happen to be in the same plane. So that's the property we assumed here. So in a slightly more detailed picture here, we have z equals lxy. This is the um, tangent line, but because this, it, it is in the single uh, plane here, right here, so that plane is given by this LXY, so if we restrict ourselves to this line, this arbitrary line we're considering, this line is a part of this plane, so this tangent line is in this graph of the uh, tangent plane, which is not sketched here, just to focus on this, this uh, tangent line case. Okay, so that's this picture. Let's not think about this r z r equals 0 right now. Then what we're going to do is that we're going to parameterize the positions in here, just like we you know, what we do this when you compute the directional derivative and stuff like that. So r is going to be the parameter. So when r is 1, here's a distance 1 there from that position. When r equals 0, here's r equals 0, distance 0. And this part will be r equals negative 1, and so on. So r is the length from this position a comma b comma zero to some point on this arbitrary line with the arbitrary direction so uh, there must be formula for x and y like this g r and h r so those are the parametric equation for x and y in terms of r once we um, did that we're going to measure this f of x y and l x y and which is the linear approximation, we're going to compare the different sides of the value, just like we did for the one variable case. Okay, this is approximation, happened to be in that plane, z equals lxy, and uh, this is actual value, right, that the red curve is actual value. Okay, so what is the difference here? And how, how different is it relative to our input size? So input size is here. So that's the same idea we did that in one variable case. So this is supposed to capture 
the kind of um, how good approximation is. Because of the tangents we are um, assuming here, everything is tangent line to the sectional curves, therefore this is supposed to approach zero. So I'm going to call that one E. So this quantity approaches zero. So I'm summarizing here everything we got. Here is a sectional um, line. It's the sectional curve. That's the tangent line and that's the sectional curve and this directional line and uh, domain part and everything here that part line is contained in the single plane and we just said that this um, approximation is a good approximation and just happening in here in this plane therefore this should approach zero so it's time to write down what this equation is so here's a comma b this we're just looking at this right above just xy plane and let's say the angle it's this line is forming with this horizontal axis could be x or y whatever is let's say that was a t then using the polar coordinate system around that point a comma b comma zero that x and y must be in that form start from a and b centered it there the rest of the part is using that you know the radius r and angle t and stuff so okay so we clarified what we mean by gr and hr specifically so we're going to use this one, f of xy minus lxy divided by r equals e. So e is a function of um, x, actually r here, that's a better, and t, that's, uh, it's depending on t as well. So if we call that as a function of r and t, and if you solve for f of xy, because the linear differentiability of uh, f of xy is about the shape of this function value, f of xy right there. So if you solve for f of xy, you get this one. And I clarify that E is a function of R and T. And another thing is R approaches 0, this function E is supposed to approach 0. So I copy down over here. So let's see um, what we can do about this, um, this structure here. So my goal is the following. We already have this linear approximation showed up nicely, L of XY, although it's all happening in just that line, but it is still in that shape for give, uh, these x and y values here, and this is not going to change as we change r, or as we, especially when we change t. That's an important point to make here. After this line, we're going to change this t, we're going to consider a different line, and this l part right there is not changing. There's this fixed linear function of two variable. So that's a good part. So what about rest of the part? To make this one exactly in the form of the differentiability definition of a differentiability, what we must have is the following. We have to write this re part in this form, x minus a e1, y minus b e2. That's the last bit of the definition of the differentiability. So I looked at this one. OK, where is r and what's going on here? So I looked at this r and actually looked at this part, x minus, this is what we want, x minus and y minus b, and try to rewrite this x minus a and y minus b in terms of r and t. So x minus a and y minus b would be simply r cosine t, y minus b would be r sine t. So e1 and e2 are just still there. Then I compare, okay, this is equivalent to that, so I want to make this one exactly like r e. So what should be my E1 and what should be my E2 such that this one turns to an E1? So I thought about various different situations that I realized that there are many, many different ways to do this. R is given and cosine T and sine T is given. And I have to choose E1 and E2 such that this whole thing simplifies to E. It sums like some sort of linear equation with a certain condition. I realize that after looking at the general solution, there is a neat one. It is easy easy to explain why that one works. But it takes time to discover that obvious one, actually. It's kind of funny to say that it's dis dif difficult to div discover sometimes the obvious one. But here it is. I discover that um, if I set the E, so uh, I forgot to mention, so this is what we want here. I want that the E, because R and R is common, so what, what I want to make is E must be equal to the rest of the part, cosine T E1 there, and sine T E2. And then everything I just explained is about to solve this equation. What should be the E1 and E2, given E, e and T in here? So, 
Again, there are many solutions, but this turns out to be need one, and once I write it like this, and everybody understand that works kind of response. So E is going to be E cosine T. So E1 here, I'm sorry, E1 is going to be E cosine T. So if I plug in E cosine T there, E and cosine T cosine T squared. And if I plug in E2 as E sine T, then E2 and then E sine T and sine T and sine T squared, and common factor of E there. So therefore, we see a common factor of E and cosine squared and cosine squared and sine squared, which is E. Okay, so that that works. So what we have discovered is that if we restrict ourselves on this line right there, then f of xy, that xy value, you know, restricted to the being on that line, is equal to this LXY, which will not change, this formulation, the coefficient involved in here will not change as T changes. That's the key statement right there. As T varies, when as we looked at the different directions, the coefficient of the linear function does not change. But rest of the part is in the shape R times cosine T and E2 sine T. So we did that to change this one to X minus A and Y minus B form. So if you combine r and cosine t like this, that is x minus a, if you combine sine t and r, that's y minus b according to this analysis right there. So this is really in that form x minus a and y minus b, and e1 and e2 were the um, values here where e and e is approaching zero, obviously e1 and e2 approaches zero. And most important part of all this analysis is that this portion right there is, does not change as we vary this t angle with various different directions. So this formula works. If you look at this formula, final formula here, f of xy and lxy and x minus a, and some function that depends on x minus a and all this direction here, but they eventually approach zero. So um, this, this, this portion f of x, y, and, and l, x, y at least doesn't depend on your choice of a t in there. So that's, uh, that's the proof that uh, f of x, y is in this shape. One additional point I'd like to make at the end is that there are two numbers. Remember the definition of differentiability goes like there are two numbers and two functions. And then I was keep um, emphasizing that there are two numbers and involved in here that doesn't depend on x and y or your t or anything. So two function part. So far this definition over e1 and e2 look like highly depending on r and t in here. But uh, the point is that we're looking at this as a function of x, y. So if you have x, y value outside this a comma b0, there's a unique value of r and unique value of t. Um, according to the, you know, polar coordinate system around a comma b. So, although these depend on r and t, this gives rise a unique function e1 and e2. Okay, but that's a slightly different flavor. We have to give it in here l x y. There's involves a unique constant there. So it's, uh, you know, we have to look at these two um, uh, independence in a slightly different way. Okay. So let me remind you of um, what we have just proved. This is again the definition of differentiability, f of x, y, it's around that point a comma b, has this nice expansion. The first part is a linear approximation, and second part it's the part that makes it a good approximation. Next part was justification of this good approximation by looking at this various tangent line of the sectional curve. If you look at this section, there's a section curve and there's this tangent line. If you collect all this tangent line, um, it forms nice uh, tangent plane, one one common plane. So that follows from the differentiable differentiability. But what we really proved here is that if we have a property that all the tangent lines to the sectional curve form a single plane like this. And that uh, that implies the differentiability of a function at a comma b. So, because each of these tangent lines is a good approximation to this sectional curve, that makes a nice connection between the good approximation idea and the definition of the differentiability. 
So let me go over some examples um, for which we're going to elaborate uh, the expansion. So when we look at the expansion of something that reminds us of a Taylor series of one variable, this is how the Taylor series one variable look like. If you have a differentiable, infinitely many differentiable functions, it might have a chance to look like this. So there are actually functions that are not cannot be written in this form except at x equals a. So the coefficient of this power series expansion must be in that shape if this happens. So if by looking at the derivative and then using the theory of uh, differentiation and integration of a power series and these coefficients have no choices and must be in that form if this is equal to each other. So this one here is x to the first, so that's a linear part. So if you look at the other parts, it, they all have x minus a as a common factor. So what I wrote here is kind of organize the rest of the part as a multiple of x minus a. So because this has starting from quadratic factor here, this error term must have x minus a everywhere. So if x, a, x approaches a, in that part, it must approach is, um, zero. So there's no y, that's a typo. So we're going to use this actually to kind of handle this type of function. We're going to show this, use this Taylor series to show this function is differentiable in the two variable sense. So first we start with this uh, notation, this x minus a and y minus b. Let's put that in, in terms of delta x and delta y. Then this x and y is organized like this, a plus some increment and b plus some increment in y, y value. So using that part, um, we can use, using this um, substitution, we can write a slightly different way. Then from there, we naturally pick up this kind of expansion. So it's uh, just a lot of algebra, nothing, nothing fancy here. So x here is replaced by a plus delta x, and y there is replaced by b plus delta y, and x appeared here again, so it must look like this. By, um, and I expanded this uh, exponent, and using exponential law, I write it as a product here. So you can see a, b, and b times delta x, a times delta y, and delta x times delta y showed up as we expand this term. And from here what I'm using is because this is not a polynomial and basically these Taylor series or definition of a differentiability and we gotta pull out some sort of polynomial linear variable or linear term excuse me. So here is, is the place where I'm using the ex, um, Taylor series of each of the uh, exponential functions. So if you don't remember what those are I want you to look it up. I was lazy enough to not to include that Taylor series formula of e, but uh, let me tell you, the e to the x was uh, here is one. So this is the expansion around zero. That's going to be one. Turns out the uh, values of the derivative is one, and second derivative value is at one, and uh, you can see the e to the x is derivative e to the x again, and second derivative also has e to the x. If you do this around x equals zero, then everything is going to be um, one one over here. So the coefficient is a pretty neat shape: one over one factorial, and one over two factorial, and one over three factorial, and so on. That's the expansion of exponential functions. But this part here is a constant, so we're not going to touch that part. Only when the variable showed up, we will use um, Taylor series. So we have. Um, to expand this one as a Taylor series, so it's a 1 plus 1 over 1 factorial times the x minus a part, which is here, everything here is a b times delta x, and we, because we chose this a is different from that a, that's 0, so called Maclaurin series, so 1 factorial is 1, so everything else can be grouped into this part here. Okay, everything else has a square part, so you can simply write it like this, not the infinite expansion form. And if you look at a times delta y, that's the same thing. The linear term of the exponential fu uh, function is 1 plus 
that input there, a times delta y. And this part is the rest of the part that has a common factor of delta y squared. So I factor on one part, the other part all goes in there. And this one is a product, so I wrote it like that. So these three factors, for these three factors, I am using um, Taylor series of e to the x, and especially in this form right here. The linear term plus um, the, the vanishing factor and the rest of the part, which vanishes again. Now everything is in a polynomial in terms of delta x and delta y, and it's a matter of expanding this. It has lots and lots of terms, but notice that e to the ab is a constant and the a is a constant and so on. So if you actually expand it, if you organize it in terms of linear part and whatever the other part that's not linear, you can be uh, group it into the following shape. This is a constant term showed up, and this is everything that has delta x in it, and this is everything that has delta y in it, only that the first part of delta y. Everything else has more than one copy of delta x or delta y. So you can always organize it into this term, in this form. So this is in that shape that you wanted to look for. Here's a constant part, which is exactly f of a, b. a goes there, and b goes there. That we picked it up. And this is some constant times the delta x, which is x minus a there. And some constant delta y. This is uh, uh, delta y is there. And here it is y minus b. And rest of the part is grouped it in this way, where the x minus a and y minus b showed up again. So we organize this f of x, y using the one variable Taylor series of e to the x, and then we were able to pull this one out. So that was nice connection to, to make from one variable to two variable function that naturally arises. But uh, this these coefficient is indeed the partial derivative of this function at a, and this is a partial derivative, a, a comma b, the partial derivative with respect to y, at the value a comma b. So those are the secrets. So um, to get to these answers quickly, that you just have to do the partial derivative of this function. So this is supposed to be an exercise that um, allows you to get uh, familiar with this definition of differentiability. So next thing I'd like to look at is a theorem that, so we're not going to go through this uh, kind of calculation all the time, to conclude some function is differentiable. So we need a nice theorem. So here's a theorem. If the partial derivative of x and partial derivative of y are continuous at a given point, then f is automatically differentiable, a comma b. I made an earlier a video about the clear outs theorem that uses this continuity property. Again, this continuity property kicks in and helps us to conclude this type of thing that via the mean value theorem. So here is the same flavor um, kicks in. So we're about to establish the differentiability. So we're going to take f of x, y, especially around this value a comma b. We'd like to um, you know, write this value in that differentiable structure, which is a linear approximation plus the error term, good error terms. So let's uh, recall the mean value theorem again. It says if I have one variable function, gx, and if I'm looking at a point alpha, so that we have a g of alpha, the difference of this function value is uh, equal to the increment, this x delta x is x minus alpha. I think I forgot to write it down. The delta x is supposed to be x minus alpha times this uh, g prime of alpha stars. Another uh, typo there is supposed to be g prime. Sorry about that. But I got it here. So the, then if you solve for gx, it's going to be, then it's going to be a nice linear approximation form, but it's a slightly different. There's no error term, and it's still exactly equal. And there is this delta x, but with this choice of alpha star, which is the number between x and alpha, we can make actual this equation actually exactly equal. gx is exactly equal to this linear approximation looking expression. So here is not g prime of alpha. If this is g prime of alpha, not g prime of alpha star, then there must be an error term. Mean value allows us to close up like this with some choices in between x and alpha, we call it alpha star. So if we apply this one to the two variable situation using this first partial 
fx here. Then we're going to fix that y and fix that y. Don't touch that y. We just play with x. So x is replaced by the base point a. And then this type of mean value theorem, delta x and the partial derivative. The choice of this alpha in between x and a, in this case here, is going to be x star. And that goes into the x slot right there. So let's look at the structure that we wanted to use differentiability of first partial x and differentiability of first partial y. And to hear that first partial x appeared, so we're going to probably do something about that. Like, uh, you know, for example, do something about that y part. So we're going to separate that part f a y and see if we can apply this type of thing just to that term. So here's f a y. And we're going to fix that a and just play with that y and apply this mean value theorem on the second slot, y, and the b there. So y is replaced by the base point b, just like the variable is replaced by base point b. And then difference, y minus b, denoted by delta y, times derivative at that y slot there. So it's a derivative with respect to y. And then to close up nicely like this, we have to use this some value in between y and b, we call it y star. That's the mean value theorem. So if we use this fy, fay formula over there, we're going to get this. That fay is replaced by what we have found here. And then we have delta x times fx, x star, comma y, which is from here. So all together, all together, this is a nice form. f of a b and delta y times this partial derivative value and delta x times this partial derivative value. So we almost are in uh, uh, this differentiable structure. We just have to be careful at the end a little bit. So I copied it here to make a um, rest of the calculation in this space. So things observe is this a uh, partial derivative x star and y that we know because of the continuity we assumed here, if we make um, this uh, x value very, very close to a, then because x star is in between x and a, then this will approach, obviously, a value because it's in between x and a by squeeze theorem. So if the input approaches the a, then output, the whole thing, must be evaluated this way. It approaches this fx a b because of the continuity. If input approaches, output behaves exactly the same way. So the key thing is that now this approaches, this value should be carefully written down. So that means this value here we're actually looking at in this expansion fx y has this the part we want fx a b plus some error term that approaches zero so that will be exactly equal with this plus e1 inserted the same thing for f y part because y is in between y and b as y approaches b and this y star had to approach b because of the squeeze theorem so as this input y star approaches b the output f y must approach this f y a b so again this uh, um, this convergence approaching property can be written exactly like this this value here with y star is the target f y a b plus some error term where this error term approaches zero and y approaches b so in this part right there fx and fy with x star and y star is this x star and y star is replaced by these term where this clean fxy and clean fy f y a b um, is there with this e1 and e2 term so see how it's going to look like so if we replace it there that uh, partial derivative x star is written in this way okay with this this part with nothing is varying so if you expand this and then you have this fx times delta x and fy times delta y and there is this e1 and e2 shows up and this has exact the correct behavior namely approaching zero behavior so i guess that concludes the proof that f of x y is in this shape that's exactly the definition of differentiability again the continuity kicks in together with the differential the mean value theorem kind of make this um, proof really nice. So let's revisit the example we did earlier with the Taylor series and delta x and delta y substitution. 
we just look at this uh, theorem here. All we have to establish, if you want to use the theorem, you calculate fx, the partial derivative, and calculate this partial derivative y, and show their continuous functions. So here's that function again. And if you compute the partial derivative, you know, treating the y is constant. And this is what's uh, going to be. Because if you differentiate this one with respect to x, we have to use the uh, product rule. So if you differentiate that first factor x, then we have this 1 times e to the xy. Then if you differentiate the second factor, x is there. And then this exponential is just that, is to the xy. But you have to dif uh, differentiate this xy with respect to x. So that will be y. So the y must be multiplied outside. But I put it together like this. The partial derivative of y is going to be, this is a constant multiple, so you only have to differentiate this one. If you differentiate x times y with respect to y, then x kicks in, becomes a coefficient, and there's another x already out there, so this will be the partial derivative. So if you look at these functions, then these are all made out of elementary functions, and there's no denominator, so um, I guess this is obviously continuous functions. So once you have this partial derivative continuously defined, then this must be a differentiable function. So here I forgot to show this part, so here's the last bit. So we, from there, we conclude that f is differentiable. All right, let's kind of summarize what we have done in this long lecture. So let me remind you of this slide. If you look at the graph of two-variable function, that is a surface, and then using a couple of sectional curves, we have a tangent line to those sectional curve that'll define the tangent planes. The idea of this tangent plane being a good linear approximation was the idea toward the differentiability. And we have to clarify this good part. So here's all things together. Differentiability, since you've been looking at this definition a lot, so I'm not going to go over this part here, but let me remind you of this good approximation property and which was this and if and we establish in this lecture pretty much that's equivalence of these two things if function is differentiable in this sense then it is equivalent to the following that all the tangent lines of the sectional curve we look at around this point a comma b comma zero then all these tangent line form a single plane. That single plane must be the tangent plane that I mentioned earlier. And then, in a sense, if you look at this all this uh, tangent line of the sectional curve, because this tangency gives you the good approximation on, in one variable sense. So, individual sectional curve is well approximated by this tangent line. So from that sense, we kind of convince ourselves that if this tangent, if there is this tangent plane that contains all this tangent line, which are an excellent approximation to this sectional curve, this is a good linear approximation as a tangent plane. So establishing these two equivalents is the sort of main goal of this um, video. And at the end, I added a couple of um, examples and additional theorem to, um, to that guarantees this differentiability. Okay, thanks for watching.